Hi there, welcome to That Board Game Show podcast, episode 10. I'm Sonia, and today here is my son with me as usual in these podcasts. Hello. That's James. And we have been talking to you about our shelves of ambition. That's the theme we've been on this year of 2023, because we decided to take all of our games that weren't played up to 10 times each, and play them. I know that's that's a very big ambition, actually. That's why it's called Shells of Ambition, because we've got a lot of games, a few hundred. So it's going to take the year or more to do this mission that we have. But I must tell you that so far it is going very, very well for us. I'm particularly enjoying it, because one, we're getting games to the table that I don't think would maybe get much time if we weren't doing this. And secondly, what we're finding that if a game has been played seven times, we play the last three times one after the other. So we don't play one one more play of that game and then take out another one and play one more play. We play, in this example, say, Corinth. We play it three more times and then we get it to ten. And we don't normally play games like that. We play a game, we maybe play it again a second time, but then we put it on the shelf and we take out another game. That seems to be our style. But with this Shelves of Ambition, that's changed a bit with our Shelves of Ambition mission because of the fact that we're playing one game three or four times to get it up to the 10, which is our goal. And that has proven to be a very, very good experience for me. And I'll tell you why. Take Celtic, for example. Celtic is one of the games that we've been playing recently. We had to play it, what, what was it, Jamie, four times? I think it was four. Four three or four times. Three or four times in a row. You know, I think it was four because I remember us doing two on the one day and two on the next day. Mm-hmm. So that was fantastic because by the time we were on the fourth play, we really knew this game well and we don't normally do that. You know, we get these long pauses in between, long time frames in between when we play a game. So I have thoroughly enjoyed that. I enjoyed Celtic. And there's a bit of a theme that's going to carry through here, even though we've got the the one theme of Shells of Ambition, but there's another theme coming in here. And that is we are of Norwegian descent. And the games we've been playing on our, from our Shells of Ambition are Ticket to Ride Nordic, <laughs> Vikings, Celtic. You see, there's a bit of a theme. Another theme, another layer. But anyway, Vikings is one of those big games. Well, we call it a big game. It quite, takes quite a long time, doesn't it? I'll tell you what, let me hand this one over to you, Jamie. Can you tell them what Vikings is and what it's about? Okay, Vikings, the board game, because mm. there are several games called Vikings. Okay. <laughs> so this one is Vikings, the board game. It's based off the TV show called Vikings. Mm-hmm. So you're playing the game and recruiting heroes and doing things within the world of the TV show. Um, So reading off Board Game Geek, uh, it's published by Catalyst Game Labs and designed and illustrated and everything by a whole list of people with names I'm not even going to try to pronounce. (laughs) (laughs) Are they Norwegian-y sounding names? No. No, they're not actually. I'm looking at them. Just a whole team of people. I agree. Just go past that. (laughs) (laughs) And description from the publisher. Vikings the board game is a strategy game of exploration and raiding based upon Mm. the dramatic television series Vikings that allows players to embrace their inner Viking. Mm. Each winter in the game, players will scheme to acquire appropriate resources while convincing heroes such as Ragnar Lothrock, Ligurtha, Rolo, and Floki to support them as they put their longships in the water to raid each summer. Plunder treasures and foreign resources across modular tiles that ensure a different game each time you play, while completing offers to the seer will ultimately lead a player to victory. Okay, well, I'd like to add to this, because now that's Jamie reading off our handy-dandy, very, very well-used board game... Board Game Geek. ...website. Thank you, Board Game Geek. Thank you, thank you. We use your website a lot and we love it. I'll put but, links to all the games we talk about today in the show notes. Oh, good idea. That will help. Mm. Let me tell you something, though. When you read that, it's not how we play, because we kind of keep to our own side of the board, and we don't do all this um, mm. 
taking it's, over each other's territory and none of that. Mm. It's not really a territory thing, so it's more a pick up and deliver type game, whereby mm. you gather the resources you need at the sort of village tile, and then you've got this modular sea, and then you sail out across the sea, and you have to spend resources ac along the way. And then when you get to the land tiles, you have to raid and trade and do all the Viking things. Right, you, but we do and that. And then you collect your stuff and you go home. So yeah. it plays two to five players, and I think it would shine with more players. I think with just two, there's not really any competition. We yeah. can pretty much each stick to our own side of the board. Which is how no... we play. We do yeah. this like friendly playing. And when you say raid, we're actually raiding the tile we land on. Yeah. We're not raiding each other. No, it's no. good. There's it's no about... direct player interaction no. apart from maybe blocking the space you wanted to go to. Or... And Tommy, did you, you normally keep a record of how long it takes to play. What, how long did we take playing? Quite long. Quite long. <laughs> There's also a whole auction. Where's my thingy gone? Oh, that whole auction section. There's also which we a whole sort of... auction element that mm. you're supposed to. So I think it's at the beginning of each round or something. You're meant to bid for influence. Mm. And then influence determines the order of play. So it's not a, a set, determine the first player and then you play clockwise. It's every season you're going to bid for influence and then the influence determines the player order. Right. And so each season you're supposed to do a blind bid to determine the influence and that we don't really do properly. <laughs> no, because there's another thing we Again, sort of skirt around that one. Any auction type things I find don't work very well with just two players because mm, it it's a it bit too deterministic. Kind of falls flat a bit. But anyway, while Jamie's looking up the uh, stats on how long we played this game for, how long it was on the table for, how long the game took to play, I can continue to tell you that it was, it's a good themed game for us, and we enjoy exploration games. I say we, I know it might specifically be more me. Do you like exploration games mm. a lot? Yeah, very much. Oh. So we then, we enjoy exploration games, and this, I get a lot of pleasure playing this game. So as I was saying earlier, I have been enjoying this, playing the same game a few times in a row. And Vikings falls into that as well, because I really enjoyed us, you know, the plays that we had on this. Even though it was so long, have you got the, the detail on how long? Average play time, two hours. You see, so it's With quite... two players. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine with more. It says on Board Game Geek, 90 to 120 minutes. And I think did... that's fairly optimistic. <laughs> we did the 120? Yeah. Okay. The other game that I wanted to share with you is the Ticket to Ride Nordic. Now, that is a much lighter, easier jump into <laughs> game. Jamie, tell us about that one. So, differently to Vikings, Ticket to Ride Nordic is specifically for two to three players. Mm. So, on the other end of the spectrum, it's better with less players than more. Mm -hmm. Playing time, 30 to 60 minutes, designed by Alan R. Moon and published by Days of Wonder. Uh, Ticket to Ride Nordic Countries takes you on a Nordic adventure through Denmark, Finland, Norway, and Sweden as you travel to the great northern cities of Copenhagen, Oslo, Helsinki, and Stockholm. This version was initially available only in the Nordic countries of Denmark, Norway, Sweden, and Finland. A worldwide limited edition release occurred in August 2008, and it has since been kept in print again by Days of Wonder. The goal in Nordic remains the same as base Ticket to Ride. Collect and play cards to place your trains on the board, attempting to connect the different cities on your ticket cards. The map incorporates tunnels from Europe and also has routes containing ferries. Ferries will require a certain number of locomotives to be played, which are the jokers, the wild trains, mm -hmm. as well as other cards in order to be claimed. Locomotives are handled a bit differently as well. On your turn, you may take two locomotives if you want. Normal ticket to ride, you can only take one if you take it from the yeah. face up supply. Mm. But you can only use them on ferries, tunnels, or the special nine length route. Unlike the USA or Europe maps, Nordic is designed for two to three players only and has a heavier focus on blocking your opponent and more aggressive play, which we don't do. <laughs> we do not do that, no. <laughs> Ticket to Ride Nordic was another game we've enjoyed in this whole um, underlying theme that happened accidentally in the whole Norwegian heritage side of our lives because we got to travel around the map 
and it was really, really fun. Again, it, we, we played quite quickly. I think it was about 20 minutes yeah. or so. Again, let's pull and up the stats. We just enjoyed repeatedly playing that one. And it was a nice filler. You know, I, I call it a filler. I suppose it's not that for everybody. But that's um, how I experienced that game. Average play time was 47 minutes. 47. Oh, I stand corrected. Our last play, I think, was pretty quick. That's where I get my 20 minutes 37 from. 37 minutes. Oh, last right. time we played. Oh, it's not, more like... Not quite 20. 40 years more. Correct. Yeah, 30, 45, thereabouts. So I mentioned um, Celtic earlier. Jamie, can you look up the board game geek um, information on Celtic? And I can tell you about the fact that, <laughs> again, this is a game that I just so enjoyed because we're traveling around this beautifully designed map, collecting bits, and you've got this, these family members. Uh, well, actually, I'm not really good at de describing the game. I prefer to tell you the experience of it. So can you describe it uh, for us, Jamie? Celtic for two to four players, designed by Dirk Hillebrecht. Sorry, Dirk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And published by Pegasus Spieler. Mm. Plays in 40 to 60 minutes, ages 8 and up. The Celtic Lord of Wetterau, I think, is looking for a successor. To prove themselves worthy, players have to travel the region and trade with neighboring tribes. Each turn they have to perform one movement with their family members. Other players at their starting location can decide to join them. While some locations allow players to collect goods, others have to be visited to fulfill goal cards, which grant influence victory points. The game ends immediately once a player has fulfilled five goal cards or chooses to reveal that they've collected one good of every kind. Players then tally up their points and the most influential Celt wins. Well, this is another one of those that the more we played it, we did just keep out of each other's way largely Again, this way. Yeah. Again, this yeah. one you don't really get in each other's way because it's more a race game than anything else. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's you're true. moving your pawns and it's kind of a game to pick up and deliver sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So you're moving your pieces around, you can follow other people's movement. You can't really block anyone else's actions. You can just piggyback off them. I'm not so sure about that because I know I was off to get the basket of fruit and you would get the basket get there before me. Yeah, but that doesn't stop you getting there and doing uh, it. That's true. That's true. You and I changed my plan a few. Yeah, you know, I've changed my direction and my mm. plan a few times. So you do have to think about what the other players do. We're not completely. It's not a completely independent solo. You in your corner. I'm in my no, corner. No, no, no. But there's no blocking. There's no negative interaction. Mm. You do have to pay attention to what the other people are doing. Mm. But what they do doesn't stop you achieving your goals. That's what true. they do can help you achieve your goals. Mm. So that was another one that we, we got to the table quite a bit and we enjoyed getting it to the table more than we would otherwise have. I think it goes without saying that if we're talking about it on a podcast, you enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is true. This is true, but I'm telling them about every game we play on our shelves of yeah. ambition to get it from a, a few players up to 10. And what I have thought before we started this mission is I thought... Maybe some of those games haven't been played a lot because we didn't enjoy them as much as we thought we would. And now I'm finding, because we were playing them repeatedly, I'm finding that I'm enjoying them more than I realize. So I suppose that's well, been shelves, a surprise to me. Our shelves of ambition are games we've already played at least five times. Mm. So that's what the shelves of ambition thing is mostly. It's games we're trying to get from five to ten plays. Because mm. we did this a couple of years back of trying to get every game in our collection to have five plays. Oh, I remember that. So anything that isn't sitting at five plays has already been filtered out. Which is very few. Because very few. I would like to tell the story about how we we are not compulsive board game buyers. Mm -hmm. we, we're amongst those that research and watch the videos and <laughs> find out, you know, as much as we can about the game. And then we have to think about whether it's a game that we're all going to enjoy, whether we like it, whether it'll be good at our board game weekend so we kind of think about all of those details before we actually buy a game so it's fairly safe to say that everything in our library is something we're going to enjoy playing otherwise we'd never have bought it we don't come across games that we just buy because we like the look of it but no, mm -hmm. don't know anything yeah, about we it we always do our due diligence and homework and research and watch playthroughs and tutorials and <laughs> and if we do come across a game that we end up just getting somehow or other and we end up not enjoying it as much well then we pass it on 
There's still a couple more games I want to tell you about, and the one is Queen Domino. Tell me about Queen Domino, Jamie. Designed by Bruno Catala and published by Blue Orange Games. Queen Domino is a standalone slash expansion for King Domino. So kind of a sequel can be ex combined with King Domino. Mm -hmm. Can also be played as a standalone game. For two to four players, ages eight and up, 25 minutes approximately. About that's, right. that's the one that was quick that I was thinking got it mixed up with Celtic. Build mm -hmm. up the most prestigious kingdom by claiming wheat fields, forests, lakes, grazing grounds, marshes, and mountains. Your knights will bring you riches in the form of coins. And if you make sure to expand the towns on your lands, you will make new buildings appear, giving opportunities for new strategies. You may win the queen's favor, but always be aware of the dragon. Hmm. Queen Domino is a game completely independent from King Domino, while offering a choice of more complex challenges. Two to four players can play Queen Domino independently, but also in connection with King Domino, mm -hmm. allowing for games with seven by seven grids for four players, or for up to six players if you stick to five by five grids. So it expands on the core principles of King Domino, which is basically dominoes, <laughs> but with, you know, the different terrain types. So you've got your fields and your water and your things, and you're trying to build out big territories and you're limited to this grid of five squares by five squares or in Queen Domino, seven by seven. Mm -hmm. And basically it's a, a strategy of how to build it together. It's, you know, like a tile lane game, like a Carcassonne or something. Mm. And who enjoys Queen Domino more, you or me? Probably me. Yeah. <laughs> I've always been a fan of tile lane puzzly type games. <laughs> yeah, Jamie actually enjoys tile lane games more than I do. Um, I don't not enjoy them, but he, he particularly enjoys tile lane games. So this is one of those um, whereby we keep it in the library because of that, because, you know, we both enjoy it, but Jamie enjoys tile lane a lot. So I could be happy not to play tile lane games, but I don't mind playing them as well. So it's interesting how each person has their own preferences. The next game is another game that I thought, um, when we first got it and we played it the first couple of times, I thought, oh, I don't know that I'm a big fan of this game. And then we played it more and more. And the more we played it, the more I liked it. And that's Corinth. Tell us about Corinth, Jamie. Designed by Sebastian Pouchon and published by Days of Wonder. Corinth is for two to four players, 20 to 30 minutes, ages eight and up. Under a blazing sun in 4th century BCE, traders come from all corners of the Mediterranean Sea to Corinth to sell their goods. Persian carpets, Cretan olive oil, Roman grapes, and Egyptian spices are highly prized by traders. Players have a few weeks to secure their place in Corinth law as its most savvy trader. Corinth is a roll-and-write game akin to a dice-only version of the board game Yisbahan. At the start of a turn, the active player rolls nine dice, then places all the dice with the highest value on the gold space at the top of the chart, then starts placing dice from the bottom of the chart up, with each value of dice being on a separate level. The active player takes all the dice on one level, then the action associated with that level. So you're going to be collecting these sets of dice and then scratching off trade goods on your various trading posts, or you're going to be moving your little merchant around, and I like it because it's got dice. <laughs> <laughs> you can also gather gold as you play and then spend that to construct buildings, which give you different bonuses. After 16 turns with four players or 18 turns with two players, the game ends and you tally up points for goods delivered, spaces visited by the steward or merchant, buildings constructed, and goats and gold still on hand. Goats and gold are very important in this game. You need goats and you need gold to do things. Yeah, I like this game because you roll dice on your turn and you keep rolling your dice and you keep uh, uh, assigning your dice. And any game that's got dice in it that you're rolling and assigning, I'm happy. So it's a game I really enjoy. Um, again, as I said just now, that because we've played it so many times in a row, I've just got to enjoy it more and more. And then the grand finale of today's That Board Game Show podcast is Catan. Now, we all know the sad news that we heard from the beginning of April 
about Klaus having passed on and we wanted to have a weekend of just honoring him and just honoring his memory. Because my goodness, you know what, we actually wouldn't be as deep in the hobby of board game playing if it weren't for Catan, I don't believe, because we have done another podcast on how we got into this next level of playing board games. And it's all thanks to Catan and, mm-hmm. and our friend Simon. And I and think we, that was on episode two. We did quite a deep dive on Catan there. Will you put it in the notes? Yeah, I'll put a link in the show notes. Because basically we have a lot of respect and regard and gratefulness for Klaus because of the fact that he, he actually, in his game, it was the thing that encouraged us on this journey into deeper valleys of <laughs> playing um, board Reignited game. the board game passion. Yeah, we, we've done board games all our lives, me as, myself as a child and Jamie as a child, but this took us but to a whole new the, level. The standards, you know, Risk, Monopoly, um, 30 Seconds. The, that everybody knows. The standard fare that everybody knows. Catan is what drove us off the deep end into yes. hobby board games. Because Simon came one weekend and he bought Catan. So we played Catan on the weekend, but we put two together. Well, two expansions. So we played Seafarers with Cities and Knights. And it was the first time we've done it like that. Yeah, I think we might have played it like that when Simon introduced it to us all the years back. Mm -hmm. Um, Or we played something similar to that. But yeah, so this was, I think, the first time we've actually combined those two expansions with the base game, Mm -hmm. which... I've heard is apparently one of the best ways to play. I think it was in an interview I think I saw with Klaus and his sons. They say that's their favorite way to play Catan. Oh, really? Is that little combination. Hmm. Well, we thoroughly enjoyed it. I just thought it was really, really nice to be able to do that just in memory of him and just have this beautiful game and all the memory of Klaus and all that he's done and his family for this game and for the whole hobby. So that is how we ended our weekend of um, Shelves of Ambition, playing Catan and those expansions. I don't think we really need to go into the details of what Catan is, would you think? I'm sure anyone listening to this podcast probably already knows. And if they don't, they can go listen to episode two, which I'll leave a link to in the description. And there's lots of videos. I'll also link to an article I recently read from Jeff Engelstein Mm -hmm. on his Game Tech newsletter, Mm. which is a very interesting sort of deep dive into the design brilliance of Catan. Oh, that would be nice. I'll drop that link in the show notes as well, because that's really worth a read. Yeah. Okay, well, we hope this has been worth the listen. We always enjoy sharing our experiences. Well, I do. I enjoy sharing the experiences of our Shells of Ambition mission. And I know Jamie, being the rules guy, he and you know he likes to look at all the details of things, and so he also enjoys looking up the stats and all the rest of it on Board Game Geek. And I enjoy having him here in the That Board Game Show podcast. So what I'm going to go and do now is say thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Klaus and family. And I'm off to put the kettle on, and thank you for listening. Bye. And I'll also say thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the show. If you want to continue enjoying the show further, you can visit our YouTube channel on youtube.com forward slash thatboardgameshow. Or you can check out our Patreon page, where we post exclusive behind-the-scenes content and little extra clips and bonus material that isn't otherwise shared on YouTube or anywhere else. And we'd really appreciate if you'd let us know if you enjoyed this episode and other episodes on the show just drop them down in the comments below if you're listening to this on youtube or however it works on the various podcast platforms i'm not sure how those things work exactly on (laughs) reviews and such so thanks for listening thanks for being part of the show and bye for now